Well hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wilder Garden and in this video we are talking all about blanket weed, a common problem with many ponds and the question that I get asked about a lot is how can I deal with blanket weed, should I get rid of it, should I leave some in my pond, what should I do with it and it's absolutely fine to ask these questions of course. Now blanket weed if you're not familiar is this green stuff here, this green sort of stringy slime that can be the bane of our lives at times within a pond. And it's actually not as bad of a problem as you might think. Now, blanket weed occurs because of three main reasons, basically. Now, the first is that there is uh, an excess of sunlight. So like this wildlife pond that I created here last year, back in 2022 uh, in a garden in Cambridgeshire, I'm back today just to carry out a little bit of maintenance and look at the blanket weed situation. And as you can see, it has built up a little bit around these margins. Uh, this, the site for this pond, it is in a very open setting. So the sunlight is uh, a big factor in how the algal growths develop, if you like, how they proliferate because the warm water is an ideal breeding ground. So that's why you often get blank all, blank all, <laughs> algal growth or blanket weed around the margins of a wildlife pond because the water is shallower so it warms up quicker and therefore it's an ideal breeding ground as I say for the algal bloom. So the first problem is sunlight. The second problem comes from a high pH in your water. Now in an ideal world we'd all have ponds that we could fill up with rainwater and obviously if you've got roofs on your house or a roof on your house then you really you should be looking to put in some water butts to be able to store as much rainwater as possible and of course you know, we're not exactly in drought like conditions here in the UK but we've had very very little rain throughout the winter so really we're not going into the year with the best of starts so where you can get some water butts on the side of your house to collect all that natural resource I really would recommend you do that because using natural water to fill up a wildlife pond is far better than using tap water because of all the nitrates and everything else in the water that we drink. So if you can do that, please do. It is the best way you can top up your pond. So a high pH is often caused by how we initially fill up our ponds, which obviously when I'm going around the UK creating wildlife ponds, I'm having to use tap water simply because there isn't enough natural water even in a couple of water butts to fill up a pond of this size, even smaller ponds than this. So really the best thing you can do is collect natural water. Now, everything that within that tap water will dissipate within a few days, so don't worry too much. And obviously it's the only way that you can really um, fill up your pond. And quite often in summer months when your water butts are dry, it is the only way. So don't panic if you have to fill up your pond in this method then it's not the end of the world. However, do be aware that it might cause you a few algal blooms like this. Now, the third reason that you're going to get buildup of blanket weed in your pond is because of a high organic matter. So let's say, for example, a bit like my pond that I'm looking to redevelop in my own back garden, um, it's right underneath a tree which goes against everything I say <laughs> when it comes to making space for a wildlife pond. Now in an ideal setting, you'd kind of set it somewhere where it gets sun for half the day or more, if you can. So it's absolutely fine if it's partly shady for the for the good part of, for a good part of the day. Um, it's not a problem at all. It just means that you have to be aware that if you are to put a pond in a setting like that, um, not like this here, but in a setting where you are underneath trees, you're going to get a lot of leaf litter dropping in and I certainly do and I have to get in every year and clear the leaves out. Now the reason being is all this decomposing matter, all this organic matter just adds lots of lo lots and lots of nutrients to the water which is not good for the water itself and it can in some instances turn water black and I have done a previous video that I'll put a link to at the end of this one on leaves and ponds so if you are thinking about where to site a pond or indeed leaves within a pond and how you should manage that then I have done a previous video on that but so that's the third reason the build-up of organic matter so if you can keep leaves out of 
your pond it's great a few leaves dropping in isn't going to hurt too much um, but obviously a lot can have a bit of a, a detrimental um, effect if you like because that leaf layer that that decomposing material can build up and build up and form like a bed of silt and that's how a lot of times in the natural world uh, ponds over decades and decades can build up so that they eventually just silt over if they get a lot of debris falling in them um, so then therefore they, they might need clearing out again so they're the three main reasons you're likely to get blanket weed in your pond and now I'm going to show you exactly how to clear it out and just what you should be doing with it when you have cleared it out hopefully this rain isn't going to go on too much longer <laughs> it's not too heavy as it is as it is so we're all right anyway before we look at how to remove it from a pond i just want to explain to you the benefits because believe it or not there are some benefits and quite a few actually to having this blanket weed within your pond now firstly if you've got any uh, frogs in your pond you're likely to have frog spawn now when the frog spawn hatches into the tadpoles the tadpoles in their formative stages actually eat vegetative matter like the blanket weed so it's a really good food source for tadpoles in your pond so a really good excuse to leave some as well um, before they move on to then uh, feeding on insects later on in their lives so it's a really good uh, source of food for them not only that pond snails as well will actually eat blanket weed so there's a couple of animals there that will eat the blanket weed which is a really good thing of course so not only is it a good food source for the above mentioned animals it's also good cover as well so tadpoles for example will hide within the blanket weed itself to avoid predation tadpoles obviously a very tasty snack a nice little um, snack of protein if you like for many many species indeed things such as uh, newts obviously newts can be a big problem for tadpoles when they are younger um, and also birds as well birds will obviously eat a lot of frog spawn if they can um, especially corvids I've seen I've had carrion crows down in my pond jackdaws as well magpies blackbirds even so a lot of birds will obviously make the most of this um, high protein snack so yes obviously any cover you can provide within your pond and that's why obviously the pond plants are key uh, they are really good it is really good to provide that cover for them to hide so that some make it through to maturity there's a huge huge mortality rate with tadpoles as i'm sure you can imagine but obviously as long as four or five make it through out of a hundred um, tadpoles then obviously that's another decent chunk of frogs that you can have in and around your garden more videos to come on all of the other ways in which you can attract frogs to your garden and the other video that i'll put a link in uh, at the end of this video is to how to attract frog spawn into your garden I'm not talking about frog spawn growing legs and walking into your pond and dropping itself there. <laughs> Obviously, it only gets there because of the adult frogs laying uh, the frog spawn in your pond. So check out that video at the end of this one for more on how you can attract more frogs and obviously therefore frog spawn into your pond. So now we've looked at the benefits of the blanket weed. I probably ought to highlight a couple of the negative points and firstly is that it can smother a lot of the sort of water surface covering plants if you like so things like the brook lime you can see over to my right your left where it is sort of creeping out into the water now luckily the leaves come above the water so it can um, it can survive okay but the blanket weed equally can smother it quite a bit so the blanket weed itself can become a problem because it is then blocking off the light to these plants and smothering them in particular things like the fringed water lily um, which now we're in mid-march the lilies are just starting to wake up then they're, they're a little bit behind of course so they will be coming up from the subsoil in another month or so but they're not yet established they've not got the, their leaves over the surface of the water so because the blanket weed can grow early on so it's more prolific in in the spring and summer months um, and it usually dies down in the autumn and the winter time and comes back when the weather starts warming up but because it can establish early it means that it can establish that surface blanket layer if you like of weed over the surface of the water before the lilies get chance to grow properly so it can shade off the water block out the sunlight and can be a problem for them so it's a balance and 
There are ways online in which people recommend you can treat blanket weed, you can put in barley straw, you can add apparently wildlife friendly chemicals, although I'm not a big advocate for that. I just think the best way you can manage this stuff is by hand, the natural way. You're not introducing any chemicals or anything like that and I just think it's the best way you can manage this, I won't say problem, <laughs> situation shall we say. But it is, it is a situation that needs a little bit of management and we'll come on to in a moment the best way you can help mitigate it the best way you can reduce the levels of blanket weed but let's have a look now at how we can remove some of this blanket weed now with me i have this tool that the client has very kindly let me borrow for the purposes of this video which is very similar to a spring rake if you've got like a metal spring rake in your garden for raking up leaves etc then that's just pretty much the same. Although this is very good because if you use my methods of, well, if you don't use my methods of creating a wildlife pond, which is fleece liner, fleece subsoil, check out the previous many, many videos on the channel of how I do it. And you just put a fleece or an underlay in and then you liner on top. The sharp edges of a rake could potentially, particularly if the pond has been exposed to the UV rays, the line has been exposed to UV rays from the sun, for a few years it could become brittle and quite easily you could sort of send this through the edge of the liner which would be not the end of the world but a bit of a problem obviously if you use the methods i use to create these wildlife ponds then you will have used fleece liner fleece subsoil and this this will not be an issue whatsoever um it's very good as well because it's actually telescopic so you can send it right out into the middle of the pond so yeah handy handy tool this is I really ought to try and start getting some of these and selling them on the Wildry Garden online shop because I think they'd be a great tool for a lot of you guys out there. Um, anyway, so how we're going to do it is just send it in like it is, almost upside down, put it underneath the blanket weed and just pull it out gently in small rafts. Now, if you're doing this later on in the year, there is the problem that you might be tempted to wrap it all up, get as much out in one go, but you could quite easily smother and hide some newts within the blanket weed, which would obviously be a big problem. Um, and a lot of other invertebrates as well. Now, each piece you need to, sadly, I'm afraid to say, just check for wildlife. Doesn't seem to be any on there. Obviously, we're early in the season, so things are early to get, um, they're not too early to get going. Um, I should say as well, there are no tadpoles in this pond. Obviously, when you've got tadpoles, it can be a problem because as we've just spoken about, the tadpoles will be hiding in this stuff. They'll be wanting to eat this stuff, so they'll be wrapped up in it quite easily if you're not careful. But the frogs haven't found this pond yet. So um, the frog spawn uh, is not here and therefore it isn't an issue. But obviously you'll have other things like uh, water lice in it, like a little wood louse, mini wood louse, um, which we may find. But when you've taken it out of the pond, don't chuck it straight in your compost heap because you probably will still have a few things in it that you haven't seen. So the best thing is to put it on some strategically placed rocks <laughs> or the edge of your pond. So leave it there for 24 hours or so just to let all the invertebrates crawl out, crawl back into the pond before then removing it and putting it on your compost seat. And it does rot down quite well. So again, I would just do it in smaller rafts so that you don't pull out too many invertebrates or animals with each rake of the rake. A couple of leaves there. nice collection of jackdaws flying over nothing seems to be on that so you get the idea so it's basically a case of just a little piece get it onto the top of the rake pull it out and then have a look to see if there's any life within it doesn't seem to be too much we are still early in the season Aha, there is. <laughs> Just here, this is why I do this. I'll put that there. We have. Just pull it out. A rather cold damselfly nymph. So that is a damselfly in the making, possibly large red or 
blue tailed damselfly or azure blue damselfly probably one of those threes and he's very cold at the minute hence he's not moving but it is alive i promise you so i'm going to pop him back in the pond or her <laughs> Perfect. So that's exactly why you need to check what you're bringing out with your blanket weed. As I say, obviously later on in the year, it could be a problem. There's a lot more life, a lot more stuff going on, but sometimes needs must. So as long as you put it on the side and let everything crawl back in for a day or two, that's absolutely fine. So we've looked at the pros and cons of blanket weed, and we've looked at how to manage your blanket weed in terms of removing it, and what the likely causes are for it being there in the first place. But I now want to talk to you about how to prevent it from establishing in the first place, which you can actually do. Now, there's three main reasons really, and the first two relate to the water temperature. Now, firstly, if you are looking to create a new wildlife pond, then really all I would say is try and make it go as big as you possibly can, because the bigger the water body, the cooler the water stays and therefore the less likely you are to have blanket weed establishing. You can see here the blanket weed is not establishing in the center of the pond because there is a lot more water. This pond's about three foot deep in the middle, 90 centimeters. So it is therefore very good um, for keeping that section of the pond cool. Around the margins, obviously every pond, no matter how deep it is, will have margins. So chances are that's where the blanket weed will build up. But the bigger you can create the pond, the cooler it will stay, the longer it will take to warm up in the summer months. So the better it will be all round. Now, secondly, the best way you can keep your water cool is by having lots of water surface covering plants. So floating leaf plants. So things like the fringed water lily, the native white water lily, which again, we have available on the online shop um, very soon. So do check that out, but they are a really good way because once you get those established, and I would always aim to create 60 to 70%, if not more of water surface coverage of these plants, they will shade the water, which will keep it cooler, which will stop the sunlight going straight into the water and warming it up faster. So the more of these you have, the cooler the water stays and hopefully the less blanket weed problems you'll have. And the third way you can help prevent the spread of blanket weed is by adding natural water to your pond, which we've already brushed on very briefly, but if you can top up with natural rainwater from water butts, as I've already said, it's the best way because the tap water from your house will have more phosphates and nitrates in it. So it really won't help things if you are introducing tap water straight from your house into the pond. You may find it's a continual battle with the blanket weed. However, I appreciate it's not always easy to collect enough rainwater to fill a pond up to where it needs to be. But hopefully by having a bigger pond, as we've said in the first point, that will also help with the water levels within a pond. The bigger a pond is, the longer it takes to warm up, the, long, the less water you use from evaporation and the more water you have to lose for those water levels to drop. So the bigger, the better in this instance with a wildlife pond. And of course it holds more wildlife. So those are the three ways in which you can help combat the blanket weed situation. Now, if you are looking to start your own wildlife pond guys, as I've already said in many, many videos, check out the Wildry Garden online shop. We sell all the fleece, liner, and the pond plants coming available very soon. Things like your water lilies and all your oxygenating plants and particularly all the marginal plants as well that you can use to create one of these wonderful habitats for wildlife. So I hope by watching this video, you've learned a few things about blanket weed. You probably, I hope, don't hate it as much as you did before you watched this video. So don't panic guys, this is a natural occurrence and don't worry, it happens with nearly every single wildlife pond that I create. It will find its own balance in time and the floating leaf plants such as the lilies really will help out. So the more of that you can encourage, the better it will be in trying to tackle this quite often tricky situation. But I hope today's video has helped. I hope it's, hope it's answered all the questions you may have had regarding blanket weed please feel free to drop some comments below if you've got any further questions and subscribe to the channel guys if you've enjoyed the video and feel free to give it a like also it really does help push these videos to a wider audience to help us create more habitats for wildlife so thanks very much for watching i'll see you all soon